Chapter One of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One How They First Heard of Atlantis rain is responsible for a great deal more than the mere growth of vegetables it is a controller if a somewhat capricious controller of man's destiny it was mainly if not entirely owing to rain that the french lost the battle of agincourt whilst if i mistake not confucius alone knows how many victories have been snatched from the chinese by the same factor it was most certainly rain that drove leon hamar to take refuge in a second-hand bookshop for so deep-rooted was his aversion to any literature saving a financial gazette or the stock and shares column of a daily that nothing would have induced him to get within touching distance of a book save the risk of a severe wetting now to his unutterable disgust he found himself surrounded by the things he loathed books ancient very ancient judging by their bindings and modern histories biographies novels and magazines anything from ten dollars to five cents and all arrayed with most laudable tact according to their bulk and condition but hamar was neither to be tempted nor mollified he frowned at one and all alike and the colossal edition of miss somebody or others poems that by reason of its magnificent cover of crimson and gold occupied a most prominent position met with the same vindictive reception as the tattered and torn volumes of whittier stowed away in an obscure corner backing still further into the entrance of the store for a better protection from the rain which now falling heavier and heavier was blown in by the wind hamar collided with a stand of books with the result that one of them fell with a loud bang on the pavement a man evidently the owner of the store and unmistakably a jew instantly appeared picking up the book and wiping it with a dirty handkerchief he thrust it at hamar see he said you have damaged this property of mine you must either buy it or give me adequate compensation what hamar cried compensation for such rubbish as that why all your books together are not worth five dollars even i've seen twice as many sold at a sale for half that amount you can't jew me the two men eyed each other quizzically perhaps the owner of the store observed slowly perhaps some of your ancestors were once yiddish in which case there ought to be a bond of sympathy between us you may have that book for a nickel what no your cheeks are hollow your fingers thin a nickel is too much for you i will take your chain in exchange and leave me the watch hamar retorted with a grim smile you are a philanthropist not a storekeeper i should leave you nothing the jew laughed there's no watch there see and he pointed to the concave surface of the watch pocket i noticed its absence at once it's been keeping you alive for some days past i'll give you four dollars on the chain and you may have the book the book's no good to me hamar grunted the money is here hand me over the four dollars and you can have the chain it's eighteen carat gold and worth at least ten dollars then why not take it to someone who will give you ten dollars sneered the jew because you know better you're no greenhorn that chain is fifteen carat at the most and there's not a man in this city who would give you more than four dollars for it very well then hamar said sulkily i agree no the money first the jew dived deep down into his trouser pocket and after foraging about for some seconds produced a handful of greasy coins out of which he carefully selected the sum named hamar who had been watching him greedily grabbed the coins bit them with his teeth and rang them on the counter with an air of relief he then slipped his watch-chain into the outstretched palm before him 
remarked upon the fact that the rain had suddenly ceased and prepared to take his departure here's the book the jew ejaculated whilst his face became suffused with a smirk don't go without it now there's no knowing but what we may not have further dealings with one another i'm a money-lender i've a place downstairs i take all sorts of things all sorts of things on the strict q t mind sub is in another moment hamar found himself standing on the wet pavement nursing the four dollars in his waistcoat pocket with one hand and mechanically clutching the despised volume with the other had he ever acted upon impulse he would most certainly have hurled the book into the gutter but on second thoughts he came to the conclusion that it would be better to dispose of it less obtrusively it was now evening and having tasted nothing since midday he realized for at least the hundredth time that week that he was hungry the touch of the dollars however only made him smile he could eat his full for twenty-five cents and yet live well for another four days and besides he still had a tie-pin and a fur coat he might get a dollar on the one and two if not two and a half on the other which would carry him through till the end of the week when something else might turn up something which would not involve too hard work and would just keep him clear of jail he turned sharply down montgomery street crossed kearney street and slipped noiselessly through the side doorway of a restaurant in a suspicious-looking alley not a hundred yards distant from the gorgeously illuminated palace hotel here within five minutes he was served with as good a meal as one could get in san francisco for the money and if the table linen was not as clean as it might have been the food was not a whit the less excellent for that at least so hamar thought and it was not until there was nothing left to eat that he left off eating when he thought no one was looking in his direction he popped the despised book under his chair and rose to go before he had gone ten yards however one of the waiters came running after him hi sir stop sir the fellow cried you've left something behind and in spite of hamar's denials the officious menial persisted the book was his in the end hamar was obliged to submit he took the book and rewarded the waiter with curses hamar next tried to dispose of it down the area of a chinese laundry but a policeman saw him and he only escaped being taken up on suspicion by parting with a dollar this was the climax he did not dare make any further attempt to dispose of the book but with bitter hatred in his heart tucked it savagely under his arm and made direct for his room in one hundred fifteenth street to his annoyance for under the circumstances he preferred to be alone he found two men sitting in front of his empty hearth they were matt kelson and ed curtis both of whom had been his colleagues at meidler meidler and company in sacramento street and like himself had been thrown out of work when the firm had smashed since that affair hamar had studiously avoided them it was true he had once been as friendly with them as he deemed it politic to be friendly with any one but now they were out of employment and in danger of starvation that made all the difference he did not believe in poverty encouraging poverty any more than he believed in charity among beggars he had nothing to share with them not even a thought and resolving to get rid of his quondam friends as soon as possible he confined his welcome to a frown hullo what's the matter kelson exclaimed when a man frowns like that it usually means he is crossed in love or has an empty stomach which amounts to the same thing curtis interposed come let the sun loose leon we've good news for you haven't we matt kelson nodded what is it then hamar grunted have you both got cancer no we've come to borrow from you then you've come to the wrong shop i'm about done and unless something turns up mighty quick i shall clear out for good i don't count on being a ghost nor yet an angel hamar said when we've done here i reckon we've done all together i shouldn't have thought suicide was in your line curtis remarked more mats i should have credited you with something more original original hamar snarled 
I defy any man to be original when he hasn't a cent and his stomach contains nothing but air. Give me money, give me food, then perhaps I'll be original. You don't mean to say you're cleared out of grub, Kelson and Curtis cried in chorus. We've come to you as our last hope. We've neither of us tasted anything since yesterday. Then you'll taste nothing again today, at least as far as I'm concerned, Hamar jeered. I tell you, I'm broke, haven't as much as a crumb in the room, and I've pawned everything, save the clothes you see me in. And yet you can buy books, unless, unless you stole it, Curtis said, eyeing with suspicion the volume Hamar had thrown on the table. Buy it? Not much, Hamar cried quickly. It's one I've had all my life, belonged to my grandfather. I took it with me tonight to see what I could raise on it and no one would have it i should guess not kelson said drawing it towards him why it's got a new label inside s leipman i know him he's slick even for a jew this looks as if it belonged to your grandfather leon if i'm not real mistaken you bought the book to-night there's something in it you thought you could make capital off of trust you for that now i wonder what it was you're welcome to see hamar sneered perhaps you'd like some water water why water well instead of tea or whiskey to help to digest the book besides it's the only thing i have to offer you look here leon curtis interrupted what's the good of behaving like this we're all in the same boat starving desperate so let us lay our heads together and see if we can't think of something some way out of it a burglary company limited for instance hamar sneered no i'm not having any i've neither tools nor experience the san francisco police handle one roughly so i'm told and hard labor isn't to my liking there are other things besides burglary curtis said in tones of annoyance we might work a fake if i work anything of that sort hamar said hastily i work alone think of something else i tell you matt and i are pretty well desperate curtis cried and if we don't think of something soon we shan't be able to think at all we've tried our level best to get work we've answered every likely and unlikely advertisement in the papers and all to no purpose so if providence won't help us we must help ourselves robbery burglary fakes anything short of murder it's all the same to us now we're tired of starving dead sick of it we would do anything sell our very souls for a meal my god i never imagined how terrible it is to feel so hungry you appear to be interested matt what is it why look here you fellows kelson said slowly this book is all about a place called atlantis that is said to have existed in the atlantic ocean between america and ireland and to have been deluged by an earthquake owing to the wickedness of its inhabitants they practised sorcery practised foolery hamar said it's tosh all tosh wickedness is only a matter of climate and there's no such thing as sorcery so i thought kelson replied but i'm not so sure now the author of this book writes darn sensibly and is apparently at no loss for corroborative testimony he is a professor too see thomas henry maitland at one time professor of english at the university of basel in switzerland there's an asterisk against his name and a footnote in very old-fashioned handwriting the s's are all f's and half the letters capitals listen thomas maitland despite the remonstrances of his friends visited spain by order of the holy inquisition he was arrested may five sixteen ninety three on a charge of practising sorcery and burned alive at the auto de fe in the grand market square madrid having in the interim been subjected to such tortures as only the subtle brains of the hellish inquisitors could devise on receipt of a message from him delivered in his supernatural body we attended his execution and can readily testify that he suffered no pain although the torments endured by those around him were pitiable to behold signed 
george richard poole physician and robert james fox merchant citizens of boston massachusetts august one sixteen ninety three right hamar said savagely don't waste time reading such bunkum it may be bunkum but if it takes away his mind from his stomach let him go on curtis interposed it's very obvious you haven't arrived at our pitch of starvation yet leon or you would welcome anything that would make you forget it even for a moment let's hear some more matt go on tell us something how to make coyotes out of paraffin paint or convert a sunday pair of pants into a glistening harem skirt anything that won't remind us of food thus encouraged kelson slowly turned over the pages of the book i see it was printed and published for i presume that means by a bettsworth and j batley in paternoster row london england in sixteen ninety basel london boston madrid the author seems to have had wandering on the brain by the by leon with your features you could easily work off a fake as the wandering jew there's money in it people will swallow anything in that line now i don't see how it would profit you anyhow hamar snarled leave my features alone and go on with your reading kelson chuckled here was one way at least in which he could occasionally get even with hamar hamar's features were yiddish and the yids were none too popular in california oh all right he said if the subject is so painful i'll try and avoid it in the future but it's odd how some things for instance murder and noses will out let me see what have we here discovery of ancient books manuscripts etc relating to atlantis apparently thomas maitland when shipwrecked on an island called innisturk off mayo in ireland found a wooden chest of rare workmanship he had seen he says similar ones in egypt and yucatan containing some very ancient books curiously bound and some vellum manuscripts which after an infinite amount of labour he managed to translate the books he says were standard histories biographies and scientific works on occultism all published in banchichesi the capital of atlantis and the manuscripts he affirms had been transcribed by one colmenes who believed himself to be the only survivor of a tremendous submarine earthquake that had destroyed the whole of atlantis the manuscripts included a diary of the events leading up to the catastrophe even to the meals how about this sunrise on the day of thoternanolge in the month of finra breakfasted on corn sop fish simona corresponding to salmon fruit and much sweet milk for god's sake don't curtis groaned skip over that part the very mention of grub makes the gnawing pain in my stomach ten times worse you're different to me then hamar grinned i love to think of it my word what wouldn't i give to be in saddler's now roast beef done to a turn eh as only saddler knows how potatoes nice and brown and crisp horseradish greens boiled celery pudding under the meat beer what going curtis had risen from the table with his fingers crammed in his ears there's a fat splice of the devil in you to-night leon he panted i've had enough of it i'm off come on matt if you want us you know where to find us only if we don't get something to eat soon you'll find us dead end of chapter one read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Two of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Two: The Black Art of Atlantis. For some time after Kelson and Curtis had left him, Hamar lolled back in his seat, lost in thought. Thought, as he told himself repeatedly, should be the poor man's chief recreation. It costs nothing and if one wants a little variety and the walls of one's rooms are tolerably thick one can think aloud hamar often did and derived much enjoyment from it 
i'm convinced of one thing he suddenly broke out i'd rather be hungry than cold one can in a measure cheat one's stomach by chewing leather or sucking pebbles but i'll be hanged if one can kid one's liver it's cold that does me a touch of cold in the liver i could jog along comfortably on a few dollars for food but it's a fire a fire i want the temperature of this room is infernally low after sunset and half a dozen coats and three pairs of pants don't make up for half a grateful of fuel hunger only makes me think of suicide but cold cold and a chilled liver makes me think of crime yes it's cold cold that could make me a criminal i would steal burgle housebreak cut the sweetest lady's throat in christendom for a fire there that little outbreak has relieved me now let me have a look at the book he dragged the volume towards him and despite the feeling of antagonism with which it had inspired him and despite the cynical attitude he had up to the present adopted towards the supernatural he speedily became engrossed on a few leaves somewhat clumsily inserted between the cover and first page of the book hamar read an account presumably in the author's own penmanship of how he thomas maitland after being shipwrecked had remained on innisturk island for a fortnight before being rescued and had spent the greater portion of that time in examining the books etc in the chest he had found his only food shellfish and a keg of mildewy ship's biscuits he was taken so the account ran by his rescuers on the bark hannah to london where he lived for five years his lodgings were in cheapside and it was there that he compiled his work on atlantis having obtained his subject matter from the atlantean books he had managed to bring with him and which after an enormous amount of perseverance and labour he had translated into english though these books were subsequently destroyed in a big fire that demolished the entire street luckily for him he had sent his manuscript to the publishers messrs bettsworth and batley a week or so before the conflagration broke out so that he was at any rate spared the loss of his own arduous and invaluable work the publishers did not accept that manuscript at once at that time there were very severe laws in operation against anything savouring of witchcraft and magic and as the manuscript dealt at length with these subjects and in a manner that left no doubt whatever that he thomas maitland had practised sorcery extensively messrs bettsworth and batley were forced to consider whether it would be injurious to them to publish it mrs bettsworth was eventually consulted as indeed she always was on extraordinary occasions and her interest in the manuscript being roused she decided in its favour within a week of its publication however it was suppressed by law all the copies saving three presentation ones to the author which he successfully concealed were destroyed messrs bettsworth and batley were put in the stocks on ludgate hill and fined heavily and he thomas maitland was ordered to be arrested flogged and imprisoned but wrote maitland i was not to be caught napping my previous adventures and hair-breadth escapes had rendered me unusually wary and perceiving a number of people among whom were two or three sheriff's officers approaching my house i at once interpreted their mission and climbing through a trap-door leading on to the roof of the building nimbly made my way to the end of the row and slipping down a water-pipe easily eluded my enemies london however being now too hot to hold me i booked passage on board the peterkin a thames trading vessel of some eighty tons and sailed for boston my flight had been so hasty that i brought very little with me nothing in fact except the clothes i stood in a stout winter suit of homespun brown cloth a cloak and a pair of good strong leather leggings a purse of fifty sovereigns all i had a knife pistol and two copies of my precious book the third copy alas i had left behind in my hurry after giving a few unimportant details as to his life on board ship maitland went on to say owing to a succession of storms the peterkin was driven out of her course and after narrowly escaping being dashed to pieces on the florida reefs 
latitude twenty four and one half degrees north longitude eighty two degrees west we ran ashore with the loss of only two lives the second mate and the cabin boy on the isthmus of yucatan close to the estuary of a river footnote one the river referred to by maitland is the river lagartos which was then in sixteen ninety one unnamed End of footnote. here we were forced to spend nearly a year during which time i made several journeys of exploration into the interior of the continent in the course of one of my rambles amid a dense mass of tropical foliage i suddenly found myself face to face with a gigantic stone sphinx which i at once recognized and identified it was tatnuada an atlantean deity elaborately described in one of the burned books much excited i set to work and after clearing the base of the idol of fungi and other vegetable growth adhering to it discovered a superscription in atlantean dialect to the effect that the image had been set up there by one hulir to commemorate the destruction of atlantis of which catastrophe hulir believed himself and his family that is his wife ozilmave and daughters taramu and niketoth and the crew of his yacht the chak more ten in number the sole survivors here then to my unutterable joy was strong corroborative evidence of the great disaster narrated in detail in the manuscripts i had found in innis turk island the existence of atlantis was now thoroughly substantiated on all sides of me i stumbled across further evidences of these early settlers here standing in bold outline on a slight eminence was a stone edifice adorned with symbolical carvings of eggs harps mastodons triangles and numerous other objects all of which were capable of interpretation and indicated that the building was a temple to some god i was much struck by the extraordinary similarity in many of the things i saw notably in the sphinx idols and symbols to many i had seen in egypt and to some extent in ireland and i at once set to work to draw up a careful analogy between the languages of those countries the word banchichesi footnote two for chiche compare the ancient maya or yucatan word chikanitsa that is name of town in yucatan where excavations are now taking place nineteen twelve end of footnote i found to contain the celtic ban a barrow and coptic isi plenty whilst i recognized in the words colmenes footnote three for menes compare mayan menes wise men end of footnote the celtic cool a man's name that is finn son of cool in taternanage the coptic toth that is name of ancient egyptian deity and urs tirnanage the name of the wife of oisin the last of the feni in chak more footnote four compare mayan chak mole a leopard end of footnote the coptic deity re in ozil mave footnote five compare ozil mayan for well beloved end of footnote the celtic mave a girl's name in Taramu, footnote six mu mayan for maka end of footnote the celtic terra a girl's name and in niketoth footnote seven nike woman's name in mayan end of footnote toth the earth's technical form of feminine gender and comparing the alphabets i traced a very striking likeness between atlantean a and gaelic or earth's earth a atlantean b and the coptic b atlantean d and the earth d atlantean g and earth g atlantean t and coptic t and many of the other letters to the atlantean c o e z i could however find no likenesses from all these similarities that is in architecture symbols letters and words i could come to no other conclusion than that there was some strong connecting link between atlantis and ancient ireland and egypt assuredly this great link could not have been merely due to stray survivors of the great catastrophe 
was it not much more probable that the earliest inhabitants of ireland and egypt had originally migrated from atlantis carrying its language and ways and customs with them moreover since the atlanteans were so deeply versed in magic and everything appertaining to the occult this migration would account for the mysticism that has always been so closely associated with egypt and ireland and for the psychic faculty so strongly observable in the inhabitants of these two countries i was highly satisfied i had proved much and my discoveries had upset many of the theories advanced by the modern sages i could now positively assert that the wisdom of the world came not from the east but from the west it was to the golden west to banchichesi capital of atlantis that humanity owed its knowledge of the sciences and arts and of all things good and evil eden if eden existed at all was not in asia it was in atlantis and the deluge that is recorded in the hebrew bible and is traditionally in the histories of nearly every tribe and nation was none other than the mighty inrush of the ocean over atlantis due to some abnormal submarine earthquake of what eventually became of the atlanteans whose relics i had so opportunely alighted upon i could only surmise the last record i found was on a tablet set up by niketoth on this she spoke of the death of hulir and ozilmave of the intermarriage of the crew of the chakmore with native women of the consequent growth of the colony and of her determination to leave it and accompanied by a chosen few to push away further inland footnote nine the anxiety of my comrades to leave the continent perforce put an end to my explorations and in the beginning of the year sixteen ninety two exactly ten months after our landing the peterkin was refloated this time nothing happened to impede our progress and in april of the same year we sighted boston here i remained for some months making many new friends and studying magic and sorcery but the love of travel had laid so strong a hold on me that i again took to a roving life i set sail for spain in november sixteen ninety two landed at caruna and made my way to madrid where i arrived on january one sixteen ninety three for the rest hamar had to turn to monsieur's fox and pool's addendum that is the footnote that matt kelson had read aloud hamar was now inclined to regard the book in a very different light what he had read seemed to him to be set down in too simple straightforward and at the same time detailed a manner to be other than true up to the present he had not believed in ghosts and witches for the very simple reason that like all sceptics he had never inquired into the testimony respecting them he had pooh-poohed the subject because every one he knew pooh-poohed it and also because it had never seemed worth his while to do otherwise but provided he thought it would pay him he was ready to believe in anything in christianity mohammedism buddhism theosophy or any other creed and granted the book he had in his hands was really written by maitland and maitland was bona fide which hamar saw no reason to doubt and granted also that maitland was sane and logical which from his writing he certainly appeared to be then there was a certain amount in the volume that in hamar's opinion was a find needless to say he referred to the magic of the atlanteans the art through which the practice of which they had got in touch with the powers that could endow them with riches the actual history of atlantis once he was satisfied there had been such a place did not interest him he skimmed through it quickly and i append a brief summary only for the benefit of more intelligent and disinterested readers the atlanteans were the oldest intelligent race in the world they existed contemporaneously with paleolithic man with whom their mariners and explorers frequently came in contact and about whom their novelists wrote the most delightful stories just as fenimore cooper and main reed in these days have written the most delightful stories about the red indians in religion they were polytheists they believed that in the work of creation many powers participated that some of these powers were benevolent some malevolent whilst others neither benevolent nor malevolent were merely neutral 
to the benevolent creative powers they attributed all that is beautiful in the world that is certain of the trees plants flowers animals insects and pleasing colors and scents all that is fair and agreeable in the human being such as affection love kindness the arts and sciences in a word all that in any degree affected the welfare of mankind and to the malevolent creative powers they attributed all that was noxious in creation all that was harmful to man and detrimental to his moral and physical progress that is diseases and all savage and filthy passions all races of low intelligence such as the paleolithic and neolithic man and all those born with black or red skins those colors being particularly significant of the malignant occult elements all destructive animals that is reptiles such as the teleosaurus steniosaurus etc birds such as the pterodactyl vulture eagle etc mammals such as the cave lion cave tiger etc fish such as the shark and the octopus etc and all ugly and venomous insects these earliest records show that at one time the physical and superphysical world were in close touch all kinds of spirits trolls pixies nymphs satyrs imps vagrarians barovians etc mixing freely with living human beings but that as the population increased and civilization evolved superphysical manifestations became more and more rare until finally they became restricted to certain conditions dependent on time and locality footnote ten types of elementals still to be met with in certain localities vide byways of ghostland published by Ryder and son end of footnote up to this period there had been no state religion no temples in atlantis if any one wished for a particular favor from the occult powers for example from the rabzis the occult powers of music the brachvos the occult powers of medicine or the derinos the occult powers of love they retired to some secluded spot and held direct intercourse with these powers the idea of praying to an invisible being who might or might not hear them never entered their minds they were far too matter-of-fact for that and it was not until superphysical manifestations had become confined to a very select few that the plan of erecting public buildings in spots frequented by the spirits so that all who wished could assemble there and communicate with them was proposed and put into operation in these buildings however the spirits did not choose always to appear to order sometimes they quitted the spot where the edifice had been erected sometimes they would only appear there periodically and sometimes out of perversity they would appear when least expected but whether occult manifestations really took place in these buildings or not those assembled to see them were persuaded by those in charge of the building who saw thereby an opportunity of making money that the spirits were actually there and in due time these buildings became known as temples and their showmen as priests every temple was dedicated to an individual spirit one to the spirit barabu another to the spirit caraboro and so on whilst in the absence of genuine spirit manifestations prayers incantations and rituals invented by the priests always attracted a large concourse of people to these temples and finally proved a greater source of attraction than the spirits themselves it was to gain favors from the occult powers that donations from the public were at first invited then demanded and the priests in this manner accumulated vast fortunes later on too there sprang up in connection with these temples colleges for the training of young men invariably selected from the wealthy classes to the priesthood and from the parents of these youthful aspirants large fees which in course of time became exorbitant were extracted thereby furnishing another source of revenue to the priests the most famous colleges for the training of priests in atlantis were those of baraboo rec footnote eleven compare egyptian ray end of footnote at kasienwo caribou rec at dianjek and bali garap rec at tijimin it was in the reign of baranile footnote twelve 
Maitland raises the question as to whether Baronial was the ancestor of Nial of the Nine Hostages. Of this there is every possibility, since many Atlanteans undoubtedly escaped to Ireland, carrying with them the knowledge of black magic, to which might be traced the Banshee and other family ghosts. End of footnote fifty-first sovereign of the dynasty of Shotak, that the evocation of spirits, from which modern spiritualism takes its origin, commenced. Baronile was most eager to see a superphysical manifestation. Being of a somewhat poetical turn of mind, he was particularly enamoured of fairies, and in the hope of seeing one constantly frequented their favourite haunts, that is, woods, caves, and lonely isolated habitations, but all to no purpose. They never would manifest themselves to him. At last he lost patience. Against the advice of his oldest and most trusty counsellors, and accompanied by one or two of his favourite courtiers, he went to an excessively lonely spot in the heart of a desert, and besought spirits, spirits of any sort, he did not care what, to manifest themselves. To his surprise, for he had grown extremely sceptical, an occult form, half man and half beast, footnote 13, probably a vice elemental, end of footnote, materialized. It informed them it was Daramara, that is, in Atlantis, the unknown, that it had no beginning and no end, and that it would remain an impenetrable mystery to them during their existence in the physical sphere, but would be fully revealed to them when they passed over into Malinoc one of the superphysical planes on this and on several subsequent occasions when it manifested itself to them it gave them instructions with regard to evocation and described to them the tests they must undergo before they could acquire the great powers the unknown was able to bestow on them namely one second sight two divining other people's thoughts and detecting the presence of waters and metals three thought transference that is being able to transmit messages irrespective of distance from one brain to another without any physical medium four hypnotism five the power to hold converse with animals six invisibility that is dematerializing at will seven walking on and breathing under water eight inflicting all manner of diseases and torments nine curing all kinds of diseases ten converting people into beasts and minerals eleven foretelling the future by palmistry pyromancy hydromancy astrology etc twelve conjuring up all manner of spirits antagonistic to men's moral progress that is vice elementals vagrarians barovians etc taking every care to observe the greatest secrecy Baranile caused a full account of these interviews with Daramara, together with all instructions the latter had given him to be transcribed in a book which he called Bronapotek. Footnote 14. All subsequent works dealing with black magic were founded on it. End of footnote. Or the Book of Mysteries, and which he kept sealed and guarded in a room in his palace during his lifetime no one held communication with daramara saving himself and his friends but after his death the secret of black magic leaked out countless people sought to acquire it and ultimately the practice of it became universal but the atlanteans little knew the danger they were incurring the spirits they conjured up though at first subservient that is to say mere instruments at length obtained complete dominion over them the whole race became steeped in crime and vice of every kind, and so horrible were the enormities perpetrated that fearful lest man should be entirely obliterated, the benevolent occult powers, after a desperate struggle with the malevolent occult powers, succeeded by means of a vast earthquake in submerging the continent and hurling it to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, where what remains of it now lies this catastrophe took place in the reign of abu nurin twentieth sovereign of the dynasty of molonikin three thousand years after the reign of baranile so ran the history of atlantis or at least all of it that need be quoted for the elucidation of this story 
that black magic the black art of the atlanteans was by no means dead hamar felt convinced and if maitland could resuscitate it why could not he at any rate he might try he could lose nothing by giving it a trial at least nothing to speak of the outlay of chemicals would be a mere song whereas on the other hand what might he not gain he eagerly perused the tests the test he must impose upon himself before he could get in touch with the unknown and acquire the magic powers which according to thomas maitland were copied from the original branopatech and including a preface ran as follows preface it is essential that the person desirous of being initiated into the black art the art of communicating with the unknown dharamara in order to acquire certain great powers should dismiss from his mind all ideas of moral progress and wholly concentrate on the bettering of his material self on acquiring riches and fame in the physical sphere his aspirations must be entirely earthly and all his affections subordinate to his main desire for wealth and carnal pleasures having acquired this preliminary psychological stage for one clear week he must give himself up entirely to the breaking of all the conventionalities of morality with which society is hedged in he must practice every kind of deception lie cheat and steal and go out of his way to seek an opportunity to avenge any personal injury and if his mind is earnestly and wholly concentrated on acquiring knowledge of the black art no bodily mishap will befall him during this time of probation he must will himself to dream at night of all the deeds he had it in his mind to do during the day when he will know by his visions to what extent he is progressing at the end of the week he must apply the tests to see if he is in a ripe state to proceed the tests number one at midnight when the moon is full place a mirror set in a wooden frame in a tub of water so that it will float on the surface with its face uppermost put in the water fifteen grains of bicarbonate of potash and sprinkle it with three drops of blood not necessarily human if the reflection of the moon in the mirror then appear crimson the test is satisfactorily accomplished number two at midnight when the moon is full take a black cat place it where the moonbeams are thickest sprinkle it with three drops of blood not necessarily human and rub its coat with the palm of the hand sparks will then be given out and if those sparks appear crimson the test is satisfactorily done number three take a human skull preferably that of some person who has met with an unnatural end pour on it a single drop of fresh human blood place it on a couch and go to sleep with the back part of the head resting on it if you are awakened at the second hour after midnight by hearing a great commotion close at hand and the room is then discovered to be full of crimson light the test is satisfactorily fulfilled number four take half a score of the berries of enchanter's nightshade footnote fifteen closely allied to deadly nightshade and known in botany as circaea it is found in damp shady places and was used to a very large extent in medieval sorcery End of footnote. two ounces of hemlock leaves in powder and one ounce of red sorrel leaves heat them in an oven for two hours pound them together in a mortar and at midnight boil them in water as soon as the contents begin to bubble remove them from the fire and stand them in a dark place and if the experiment is to prove satisfactory three bubbles of luminous green light will rise simultaneously from the water and burst number five in the above preparation after the test described soak a hazel twig fashioned in the shape of a fork on meeting a child hold the fork with the v downwards in front of its face and if the child exhibits violence and signs of terror and falls down the experiment is successful number six take a couple of handfuls of fine soil from over the spot where some four-footed animal has recently been buried put it in a tin vessel 
mix it with three ounces of asafoetida and one dram of quassia chips to which add a death's head moth acherontia atropos heat the vessel over a wood fire for three hours then remove it and place it on the hearth rake out the fire and make the room absolutely dark keep watch beside the vessel and if at the second hour after midnight any strange phenomena occur the test will be known to have been satisfactorily executed addendum if any of these tests fail the candidate must wait for six months before giving them a further trial and he must occupy the interim by training his thoughts in the manner already prescribed but if on the other hand the tests have been successfully performed he can proceed with the rites appertaining to the black art hamar had read so far when with a gesture of impatience he closed the book what a fool i am he exclaimed to waste my time with such stuff but maitland writes in such a devilish convincing way jerusalem any straw is good enough for the drowning man and if witchcraft and sorcery with motors dashing by every second and the whole air alive with wireless and telephones is a bit beyond my comprehension but then all i care about is money and i'll leave no stone unturned to get it if it were possible for man to get in touch with daramara the unknown devil or whatever else it chooses to call itself i'll call it an angel if it only gives me money twenty thousand years ago why shouldn't it be possible to get in touch with it now anyhow as i said before i'll have a try as far as the preliminary stage is concerned i fancy i'm pretty well fixed my mind is occupied right now with things of this world i don't give a cent for anything belonging to another and if only i had half a dozen souls i'd sell them right away now for less than twenty thousand dollars a damned sight less as for these tests foolish isn't the word for them but it won't cost much just to try them now according to thomas maitland the ceremony of calling up the unknown stands a far greater chance of success if there are three human beings present but of course if there is any truth in this business i'd rather keep the secret of it to myself however if i try alone the unknown may not come to me and then i shall have had all the trouble of going through the tests for nothing ah now i see if the other two get more of the profits than i think necessary i can make use of my newly acquired occult power to to dissolve partnership ha ha i could i could trick the unknown if it comes to that trust a jew to outwit the devil i'll just look up kelson and curtis end of chapter two read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california Chapter Three of the Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Three: Learning to Sin. Monsieurs Kelson and Curtis did not live in Pacific Avenue, where the popes held sway, nor yet in California Street, where the Crockers are wont to entertain their millionaire friends where they lived there were no massive granite steps flanked with equally massive pillars such as herald the approach to the knob hill palaces no rare glass bow windows looking out on to flower bedecked lawns no vast betiled hall with rotundas in the centre no highly polished oak staircases no frescoed ceilings no tufted cerulean blue silk draperies and no sweet perfumery only the smell if one may so suddenly sink to a third-class expression only the smell of rank tobacco and equally rank lager beer no messieurs kelson and curtis resided within a stone's throw of the five-cent baths in rutter street and that was the nearest they ever got to bathing their suite of apartments consisted of one room about ten by eight feet which served as a dining-room drawing-room study boudoir kitchen bedroom and from sheer force of habit i was about to add bathroom but as i have already hinted cold water on half-empty stomachs and chilly livers is uninviting 
Besides, soap costs something. Their furniture was antique, but not massive, nor could any of it be fairly reckoned superfluous. All told, it consisted of a bedstead, three six-foot planks on four cigar cubes, the bedclothes, a pair of discarded overalls, a torn and much emaciated blanket, a woolly neck wrap, a yellow vest, and the garments they stood in, a small, round, and rather rickety deal table, and one chair. Of the very limited number of culinary utensils, the frying pan was by far the most important. Its handle served as a poker, and its pan, as well as for frying, roasting, and boiling, did duty for a teapot and a slop basin. They had no crockery. They had only one thing in abundance, namely, air. For the lower frame of the window, having long lacked glass in it, a couple of pages of the examiner fixed in it, flapped dismally every time the wind came blowing down 216th Street. They had not lived there always. In the palmy days of work, before the firm smashed, they had aspired to what might properly be called diggings, and moreover had digged in respectable surroundings. It was the usual thing, the thing that is happening always, every hour of the day, in all the great cities of the world, starvation through lack of employment. Civilization still shuts its eyes to everyday poverty. Who knows? Who cares? Who is responsible? No one. Is there a remedy? Ah, that is a question that requires time. Time, always time. Time for the politician, and time for the starving ones. Half the world thinks, whilst half the world dies. And the cause of it all is time. Too much, a damned sight, too much time. But Kelson and Curtis could not grumble. They had their room, bare, dirty, and well ventilated, for next to nothing. Fifty cents a week and they could furnish it as they pleased. Fancy that! What a privilege! They were glad of it all the same, glad of it in preference to the streets, and probably, when asleep, they thought of it as home. But on leaving Hamar's that evening, they had fully resolved to convert their little room into a cemetery. What else could they do? What can anyone do who has no money and no prospect of getting any? and who has reached the pitch of acute hunger. He has passed the stage of wanting work, because, if work were offered to him, he would not be in a fit state to do it. He would be too weak. Too weak to work. What a phenomenon. Yes, to all those who have never missed a day's meals. To others, no. They can understand, and understand only too well, the really poor who have long ceased to eat cannot work. They are beyond it. When Curtis and Kelson staggered down the stairs of the house where Hamar lodged, they realized that unless something turned up pretty soon, it would be too late. They would be past the stage of caring for anything, too feeble to do anything but lie on the ground and pray that death would come quickly. Home? Kelson inquired as they emerged onto the pavement. Al! Curtis answered, and Kelson, taking it for granted that the terms were synonymous, at once headed for their garret. "'Don't walk so confoundedly fast,' Curtis gasped. "'This pain in my side is like a hundred stitches rolled in one. It fairly doubles me up. Ease down a bit, for heaven's sake.' Kelson obeyed, and presently came to a dead halt before a dingy-looking restaurant. Both men leaned against the window and gazed wolfishly at the food. A warm, fetid rush of air from under the grating at their feet tickled their nostrils and mocked their hunger with a mockery past endurance. Arranged on the window sill was a miscellaneous collection of very smeary plates and dishes containing an even more miscellaneous collection of food. A half-consumed ham with more than a mere suspicion of dirt on its yellowish-white fat some concoction in a bowl that might have been brawn made from some peculiarly liverish pig, or from one of the many homeless mongrels that roam the streets at night, a pile of noxious-looking mussels side by side with a glistening mass of particularly yellow whelks, a round of what purported to be beef, very fat and very underdone, some black shiny sausages and a score or so of luridly red polonies, 
a similar assortment was to be seen on the counter behind which lolled an anemic girl in a dirty cotton blouse and a much soiled sky blue skirt a month ago such an exhibition would have been an offence in the fastidious eyes of messrs kelson and curtis but now it was otherwise their stomachs would have refused nothing short of garbage matt curtis's hands had left off clutching at his belt and were now hanging by his side the fingers twitching to and fro in a manner that fascinated kelson matt is there any logic in our starving none excepting that we haven't a cent between us kelson rejoined i know that curtis went on slowly but i, I mean why should we starve when all this grub is within two inches of us it's unreasonable it's intolerable doesn't the smell of it satisfy you kelson replied attempting to force a smile and failing dismally damn the smell curtis cried it's the ham i want i'd give my soul for a good munch at it and just look at that tea too don't you see it steaming over there what wouldn't i give for just one cup ten minutes more and it may be too late the pain will come on again and it will be very doubtful if i shall ever get home i'm close on the stage where one begins to digest one's own stomach curse it i won't starve any longer matt she's in there all by herself so i've been thinking kelson murmured glancing uneasily up and down the street still she's a girl ed that's just it curtis whispered it is because she is a girl if she were a man in our present condition we shouldn't stand a chance come on it's this or dying in the gutters it's our one and only chance let's go in have a feed take what we can and make a bolt for it if she tries to stop us we can settle her right enough without being too rough there's no need to be too rough with her ed i shouldn't stick it much curtis answered occasions like these don't admit of chivalry come along it's the ham i'm after curtis shuffled forward as he spoke and the next moment kelson and he were standing in front of the counter the girl eyed curtis very dubiously and it is more than likely would have refused to serve him had he been alone but her expression changed on looking at kelson kelson was one of those individuals who seldom failed to meet with the approval of women there was a something in him they liked probably neither he nor they could have defined that something but there it was and it came in extremely handy now what do you want she inquired shortly ham give me some of that ham over there miss and a cup of tea bread too curtis cried eagerly do you know what it is to have a twist on miss i have one on now so please give us a full twenty-five cents worth kelson said nothing but his eyes glistened and the girl wondered as she passed him the polonies both men ate as they had never eaten before and as they would not have eaten now had they paid any attention to the advice of hunger experts however they survived and when they could eat no more they leaned back in their chairs to enjoy the sensation of returning albeit slowly returning strength curtis was the first to make a move matt he murmured we've about sat our sit we'd better be off you go and say a few nice words to the girl and make pretense of paying i'll secure the ham there's still a good bit left and anything else i can grab the moment i do this throw these chairs on the ground so that the girl will fall over them when she makes a dash for me which she is certain to do we will then head straight away for two hundred sixteenth street don't look so scared or she will think there is something up she has never taken her eyes off you since we sat down she's rather a nice girl kelson said i wish i didn't look quite such a blackguard and i wish i hadn't to be quite such a blackguard who'll pay for all this will she we shan't anyway curtis sneered come this is no time to be sentimental it was a question of life and death with us and we've only done what anyone else would do in our circumstances the girl won't lose much are you ready curtis rose and kelson who was accustomed to obey him reluctantly followed suit a look almost suggestive of fear came into the girl's eyes as they encountered those of curtis and she shot a swift glance at an inner door then kelson spoke and as she turned her head towards him her lips parted in a sort of smile nice night miss isn't it kelson said 
halting halfway between the counter and the chairs. "'Aren't you a bit lonely here all by yourself?' "'Sometimes,' the girl laughed. "'But my mother's in the room there,' and she nodded in the direction of the closed door. "'And one can't be too dull when she's about. She's that there active, as a rule. There's no keeping her quiet. Only just at present.' Here she glanced apprehensively at Curtis. "'She's recovering from ague. Gets it every year about this time. Your friend seems to have kind of taken a fancy to our ham.' Kelson looked at Curtis, and his heart thumped. Curtis's right hand was getting ready to spring at the ham, whilst his left was creeping stealthily along the counter in the direction of a loaf of bread. Kelson slowly realized that an acute crisis in both their lives was at hand, and that it depended on him how it would end. He had never thought it possible to feel as mean as he felt now. Besides, his natural sympathy with women tempted him to stand by the girl and prevent Curtis from robbing her. He was still deliberating when he saw two long, dark objects with lightning rapidity swoop down on the plates and dishes. There was a loud clatter, and the next moment the whole place seemed alive with movement. A voice, which in his confusion he did not recognize at once shouted, and seemingly from far away, "'Quick, you fool! Quick! Fling down the chairs and grab those sausages!' Whilst from close beside him, almost, he fancied in his ears came a sh wild shriek of, mother mother we are being robbed had the girl appealed to him to help her it is more likely that kelson who was even yet undecided what course to adopt would have offered her his aid but the instant she acted on the defensive his mind was made up a mad spirit of self-preservation swept over him and dashing the chairs on the ground at her feet he seized the sausages and flew after curtis Ten minutes later, Curtis and Kelson, their arms full of spoil, clambered up the staircase of their lodgings and reeled into the room. Look, Curtis gasped, sinking into the chair. Look and see if we are followed. There's no one about, Kelson whispered, peering cautiously out of the window. Not a soul. I don't believe after that first rush across Rudder Street anyone noticed us. To leave off running was far the best thing to do. You are a perfect genius, Ed. I wonder if this sort of thing, er thieving is dormant in most of us i say old fellow i wish i hadn't looked at that book of amars do you know directly i took it up an extraordinary sensation of cunning came over me and i declare when i put it down i felt it would take very little to make me a criminal we're both criminals now in the eyes of the law anyway curtis said and now we've got so far there's no alternative but to go on it's easier for a hundred camels to pass through the eye of a needle than for a clerk to get work that's a fact the markets are hopelessly overstocked no one wants us no one helps us no one even thinks about us the laboring man gets pity and scents galore we get nothing nothing but rotten pay whilst we work and when we're out of work doss houses or curbstones damn clerks i say damn everything there's no justice in creation there's no justice in anything and the only people who prate of it are those who have never known what it is to want say when shall we take the next lot when we're obliged not before kelson said or rather you do as you like and i'll do the same well i'm not going to commit suicide anyhow curtis sneered we haven't the money to buy poison and i've no mind to drown myself or cut my throat they're too painful if we don't go on doing what we've done to-night what are we going to do trust to luck kelson sighed all right you trust to luck but i won't trust any more in providence and that's a fact curtis retorted we've been done enough now i'm for doing other people good night he tumbled into the makeshift bed as he spoke and in a few minutes worn out after the unwanted exertions of the evening both men were fast asleep they were at breakfast next morning real dejeuner a la carte sausages bread water and they were doing ample justice to it when someone rapped at the door for a few seconds there was silence their hearts stood still had they been followed after all was it the police someone spoke and they breathed again it was hamar this looks like starving i must say hamar exclaimed as he sniffed his way into the room and sat on the bed why from what you fellows told me last night i thought you were cleared out and here you are stuffing like roosters you look a bit surprised to see me 
but you'll look more surprised i reckon when i tell you what brings me here you remember that book kelson and curtis nodded well hamar went on i read it after you left last night and i've come to the conclusion that there's something in it that may be of use to us us curtis ejaculated yes us hamar mimicked it contains full particulars of how we can get in touch with certain occult powers that can give us money or anything else we want rot of course curtis said you say that now but listen to me hamar replied since i've read that book i believe there's a lot more in occultism than people imagine you may recollect the name of the author of the book thomas maitland well to begin with he impresses me as being truthful and he not only believed in magic but he practised it if he hadn't gone into details i shouldn't think anything of it but he's so darned thorough and tells you exactly what you've got to do to get in touch with the occult powers and to practise sorcery he learned it all from that old manuscript he found written by an atlantean and the atlanteans he says were adepts in every form of occultism i tell you this chap himself scoffed at it at first and it was more out of curiosity he says than because he was convinced that he began to experiment he afterwards came to the conclusion that the atlanteans were no fools what they had written about the occult was absolutely correct there was another world and it was possible to get in touch with it now if thomas maitland was able to practise sorcery why can't we there was a gap of close on twenty thousand years between his time and that of atlantis and there's not so much more than two hundred years between his day and ours but of course if you're going to pooh-pooh the whole thing i won't trouble to tell you any more well leon kelson ejaculated magic and sorcery do seem a trifle out of date don't they could any one look out of the window at what is going on in the streets below and at the same time believe in fairies and hobgoblins still the book made a bit of an impression on me so that i'm inclined to agree with you anyway go ahead ed is agreeable aren't you ed curtis gave a sulky nod i'm not averse to anything that may put us in the way of a livelihood he said hamar somewhat appeased briefly informed them of the tests and other preliminaries necessary for the acquirement of the black art and without more ado proposed that they the three of them should form a syndicate and call it the sorcery company limited to begin with he said we might sell tricks and spells and later on tackle something more subtle why we could soon knock all the jugglers and doctors on the head and make a huge fortune that is to say if it isn't all humbug curtis observed well do you or don't you think it worth trying hamar cut in you call me a jew but jews you know have a tolerable cool head and a keen faculty for business they don't touch anything unless it is pretty certain to bring them in money will you try y e s curtis said slowly i'll try and you matt hamar queried we must have three i don't mind trying kelson replied i expect it will be only a try that settles it then hamar cried now we'll get to business to begin with we're all wholly occupied with things of this world money chiefly sometimes music curtis said sententiously and sometimes girls kelson joined in music suppose on ed's part i don't believe he really cares a bit for it he's far too material just what i want him to be hamar laughed girls are material enough too especially when you take them out to supper anyhow money is our first consideration isn't it to this there was general assent the preliminary requirement is fixed then hamar said now for the week of wild oats lying stealing cheating anything to counteract the code of moses let's take them in turn lying won't trouble us much everyone lies lying is the stock in trade of doctors lawyers sky pilots storekeepers and dentists curtis chimed in and shop girls kelson added all women rich as well as poor hamar went on lying is woman's birthright she lies about her age her looks her clothes everything with a lie she sends callers away and when she is in the mood entertains them with lies women are born liars but they are not the only liars 
in these days of keen competition everyone lies every editor publisher undertaker piano tuner dustman they couldn't live if they didn't moreover lying is natural to us all every child lies as soon as it can speak and education merely teaches him to lie the more effectually lying comes just as natural as sweating or kissing kelson interrupted or any of the other so-called vices hamar continued so we can manage that all right as to cheating having nothing to cheat with according to instructions we've got to keep in with each other so present company is accepted we must pass over that now how about thieving never done any yet so can't say curtis exclaimed nor i either kelson put in rather hurriedly well i didn't suppose you had hamar laughed though after all more than half the world does thieve all employers steal labour from their employees all tradesmen steal a profit the wholesale man from the middleman the middleman from the retailer every government thieves look at england righteous england at one time or another she has stolen land in every part of the world but theft is an ugly word when statesmen steal it's called diplomacy when the rich steal it's called kleptomania or business and it's only when the poor steal that stealing is termed theft we who have every excuse we who are starving will be content with that is to say we will only take just enough to keep us alive a few lumps of sugar a handful of raisins or a loaf of bread how about that i might manage that curtis said i might but i don't want to get caught and you matt i don't mind stealing food so much kelson said in the face of so much wealth and waste too it seems a bigger sin to starve than to steal a loaf of bread the lying and stealing are fixed then hamar laughed what you have to do is to make the most of every opportunity you can find of doing people present company accepted bad turns i don't see how in our present condition we can do any one much harm curtis remarked we haven't even the means to buy a tin sword let alone a bomb or pistol if we wish them ill perhaps that will do instead possibly but don't be such an ass as to wish any one any good hamar said do your best to carry out the injunctions i have given you and we will meet here this day week to discuss the tests End of chapter 3, read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California. Chapter 4 of The Sorcery Club by Elliot O'Donnell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 4 The Tests seven days later hamar again knocked at curtis's and kelson's door and walked in a faint sigh of relief escaped him i see we are all right so far he said i wondered whether i should find you both flown or lying stretched in the icy hands of death have you experimented we have curtis said we've done our best in what way we prefer not to say perhaps there is no need hamar replied eyeing the mantel shelf which bore ample testimony to a full larder and glancing at curtis's feet which were encased in a pair of new and very shiny boots a handsome overcoat that was hanging on the door also attracted his attention but that he had seen before and concluded that it had been there on the occasion of his last visit but you had better dry up now ed he continued somewhat caustically or there'll be no chance of forming the sorcery society it will be dissolved before it started there's no need to ask if you've tried to carry out instructions as to thoughts i see it in your faces i could never have believed one experimental week in badness would have made such a difference in your looks you told us to try hard kelson murmured and naturally we did i reckon you've done the same by your expression i should hardly have known you it shows pretty clearly curtis said what a lot of bad is latent in most people and that the right circumstances only are needed to bring it out starvation for instance is calculated to bring out the evil in any one no matter whom but what puzzles me is how we have escaped being caught that's a good sign hamar said it bears out what is written in the book 
if you give your whole mind to doing wrong during this trial week you'll meet with no mishap but you must be heart and soul in it hunger made us hunger has been our friend what do you mean curtis said why hamar replied if we hadn't been well nigh starving we shouldn't have been able to carry out the instructions quite so thoroughly have you two stolen curtis queried i have certainly appropriated a few necessaries hamar said shortly but i mean to stop now we have higher game to fly at now with regard to the tests i have not been idle i can assure you i have secured all the requisites the mirror and black cat i well er to use a conventionalism that comes in rather handy the mirror and cat i picked up the skull i borrowed from a medical i know the moth er from someone's private collection and the elderberries hemlock and chemicals i obtained from a drug store man in battery street with whom i used to deal the moon will be full to-night so that we may as well begin will you come round to my room at eleven thirty they promised and hamar as he took his departure again glanced at the handsome fur coat hanging on the door he was hardly out of hearing when curtis looked across at kelson do you think he recognized it he whispered you may bet he did and he had only just stolen it himself however it's his own fault he told us to lie and steal and we've done his bidding we have indeed kelson sighed at least you have for my part i'd rather be content with food well i needed clothes just as much as food curtis snarled if i went about naked i should only be sent to prison that's the law it punishes you for taking clothes and it punishes you for going without them there's logic for you curtis and kelson spent the rest of the day indoors and at night sallied forth to hamar's the solitary attic if one could thus designate a space of about three square feet which comprised hamar's lodging had the advantage of being situated in the top story of a skyscraper at least a skyscraper for that part of the city from its window could be seen high above the serried tanks of chimney-pots on the opposite side of the street those two newly erected buildings william carman's chewing gum factory in harn street and mark goddard's eight-storied private residence in van ness avenue and as if this were not enough architectural grace for the eye to dwell on glimmering away to the right was the needle-like spire of moss bates devil dodging establishment in branman street whilst just behind it in saucy mocking impudence peeped out the gilded roof of the knee brothers recently erected cinematograph palace all this and more much more was to be seen from hamar's outlook all for the sum of one dollar and a half per week when curtis and kelson entered the room was aglow with moonlight and hamar and the black cat were stealthily regarding one another from the opposite corners of the room from far away from somewhere in the very base of the building came the dull echo of a shout succeeded by the violent slamming of a door whilst from outside from one of the many deserted thoroughfares below rose the frightened cry of a fugitive woman otherwise all was comparatively still you're a bit early was hamar's greeting but better that than late everything is ready so all we've got to do is to wait till twelve sit down they did as they were told presently the cat forsaking its sanctuary and ignoring curtis's solicitations glided across the floor and climbing on to kelson's knee refused to budge the trio sat in silence till a few minutes before midnight when hamar rose and selecting a spot where the moonbeams lay thickest placed thereon the tub of water in which with its face uppermost he proceeded to float a small mirror set in a cheap wooden frame he then calmly produced a pocket-knife what's that for kelson inquired nervously blood hamor responded one of us must spare three drops the conditions demand it and after all the ham and sausages you two have eaten i think one of you can spare it best which of you shall it be come there's no time to lose matt has more blood than i have curtis growled but why not the cat it would spoil our chances with it for the other experiment hamar said it's a sulky cross-grained brute and would give us no end of trouble besides it can bite look here let's draw lots 
curtis and kelson were inclined to demur but the proposed method was so in accordance with custom that there really did not seem any feasible objection to raise to it accordingly lots were drawn and hamar himself was the victim curtis laughed coarsely and kelson hid his smiles in the cat's coat a neighbouring clock now began to strike twelve look alive leon curtis cried nudging kelson's elbow look alive or it will be too late the unknown is mighty particular to a few seconds let me operate on you i've always fancied i was born to use the knife but i've really missed my vocation you needn't be afraid there's no artery in the palm of your hand you won't bleed to death thus goaded hamar pricked away nervously at his hand and after sundry efforts at last succeeded in drawing blood three drops of which he carefully let fall in the tub i wish it was light so that we could see it curtis whispered in kelson's ear i believe jews have different coloured blood to other people though kelson was apprehensive hamar did not appear to have heard his whole attention was riveted on the mirror on the face of which was a reflection of the moon i knew nothing would happen curtis cried you had better wipe your knife or you'll be arrested for severing someone's jugular hullo what's up with the cat hamar was about to tell them to be quiet when kelson caught his arm leon look what's the brute doing is it mad kelson gasped hamar turned his head and there crouching on the floor in the moonlight was the cat its hair bristling on end and its green eyes ablaze with an expression which held all three men speechless when they were at last able to avert their eyes a fresh surprise awaited them the reflection of the moon in the mirror was red not an ordinary red not merely a colour but red with a lurid luminosity that vibrated with life with a life that all three men at once recognized as emanating from nothing physical from nothing good it vanished suddenly quite as suddenly as it had come and the reflection of the moon was once again only a reflection a white placid sphere for some seconds no one spoke hamar was the first to break the silence well he exclaimed drawing a long breath what do you think of that are you sure you weren't faking curtis said i swear i wasn't hamar replied besides could anyone produce a thing like that the cat didn't think it was a fake i knew what it was right enough besides why are your teeth chattering why are yours curtis retorted why are mats shall we try the second hamar asked no kelson and curtis said in chorus no we've had enough for one night we'll be off i think i'll come with you hamar said after what has happened i don't quite relish sleeping here alone or rather with that cat hi satan where are you satan was not visible it had probably hidden under the bed but as no one cared to look its whereabouts remained undiscovered with the coming of the sun the terrors of the night wore off and the trio separated hamar would on no account accept his friend's invitation to breakfast on the sausages and hams they had run such risks in procuring he made hasty tracks for a snug restaurant in bolter street where he had a sumptuous repast for a dollar and then slunk home shortly before midnight all three met again and at once commenced preparations for the second test the question arose as to who should hold satan they all had vivid recollections of the cat's behaviour the previous night consequently no one was anxious to officiate finally they drew lots and fate settled on curtis an exciting chase now began satan demonstrating his resentment of their treatment of him at every turn knocked over a water bottle ripped the skin of kelson's knuckles and made his teeth meet in the fleshy part of curtis's thumb hello what are you up to curtis savagely demanded as hamar thrust a cup at him hold your hand over it hamar said sharply don't suck it we want blood for this test and for the next i wish the brute had bitten you curtis snarled then perhaps you wouldn't be so precious keen on economics you did right to name it satan and if it doesn't attract devils nothing will i'm not going to touch it again see if you can hold the beast by yourself matt it seems to be less afraid of you than either of us kelson called out puss and the cat at once came to him 
as it was now striking twelve hamar carefully shook three drops of curtis's blood from the cup on to satan's back while he instructed kelson to rub the animal's coat with the palm of the hand kelson cautiously obeyed there was a loud crackling and a shower of sparks of the same lurid red colour as the reflection in the mirror on the previous night flew out into the enveloping darkness that will do hamar observed quietly test two is satisfactorily accomplished we must be riper for hell than we imagined there is no need for you fellows to stay any longer i can manage the third test alone as soon as his colleagues had gone and he felt assured they were no longer within hearing hamar took a saucer from the mantel-shelf filled it half full of milk and poured into it some colourless liquid out of a tiny phial labelled poison here pussy he called out softly pretty pussy come and have your supper pussy and satan unable to resist the tempting sight of the milk crept out of his hiding-place and quite unsuspiciously dipped his tongue into the saucer and laughed hamar in the meantime went to a box at the foot of the bed and produced a sack then he slipped on his boots and coat and opening the door of a cupboard near the head of the bed fetched out a small spade he was now ready and so was pussy that paves the way for test six hamar observed no one can say i am a waster i make use of everything and every one and so saying he tumbled the cat into the sack and hurried out some half hour later he had returned to his room and was busily engaged in making preparations for test three letting a drop of curtis's blood fall on the skull he put the latter under his pillow and retired to rest he had slept for little over an hour when he awoke with a start the muffled sound of hammering as of nails in a coffin was going on all around him and occasionally it seemed to him that something big and heavy stalked across the floor but in spite of the fact that the room was illuminated with a red glow the same lurid red as had appeared in tests one and two nothing was to be seen the phenomena lasted five or six minutes and then everything was again normal hamar was so terrified that he lay with his head under the bedclothes till morning and vowed nothing on earth would persuade him to sleep in that room again but sunlight soon restored his courage and by the evening he was quite eager to go on with the next test he had some difficulty in persuading any one to allow him the use of an oven for so pernicious a mixture as nightshade and hemlock but at last he overruled the objections of some good-natured woman the mother of one of the office boys at his former employers and test four proved as successful as the previous three the preliminary part of test five was also successfully accomplished but in carrying out the second part of it hamar all but met with disaster he was walking along kearney street with the specially prepared hazel twig carefully concealed beneath his coat when just opposite sadler's jewelry store he came across a child standing by itself the nearest person being some fifty yards away and no policeman within sight hamar concluded this was too good an opportunity to be lost he whipped out the twig and held it in the manner prescribed in front of the child the effect was instantaneous the child turned white as death its eyes bulged with terror and opening its mouth to its full extent it commenced to shriek and yell then it fell on the pavement and clutching and clawing the air and foaming at the mouth rolled over and over people from every quarter flocked to the spot and judging hamar from his proximity to the child to be responsible for its condition shouted for the police the latter however arrived too late hamar whose presence of mind had only left him for the moment seeing a bicycle leaning against the store door jumped on it and soon put a respectable distance between himself and the crowd that night the trio met once more in hamar's room for test six there was a wood fire in the grate and on it a tin vessel containing the prescribed ingredients somewhat unpleasantly conspicuous among these ingredients were the death's head moth and the soil from satan's grave as soon as the mixture had been heated three hours the vessel was removed the fire extinguished and the room made absolutely dark then the three sat close together and waited on the stroke of two every article in the room began to rattle whilst out of the tin vessel flew a blood-red moth after circling three times round each of the sitter's heads the moth flew back again into the vessel and the silence that ensued was followed by a soft tapping at the window 
and the appearance of something that resembled a big tube filled with a thick pale blue fluid made up of a mass of distinct veins this tube floated into the room and passing close to the three sitters who involuntarily shrank away from it disappeared in the wall behind them a loud crack as if the branch of a tree had broken terminated the phenomena the room again becoming pitch dark but the three sitters although they knew there would be no further manifestation that night were too terrified to move they remained huddled together in the same spot till the morning was well advanced end of chapter three read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california